Hello, Cornerstone. Uh, we are living in unusual days, and so we're uh, experimenting with some new ways of communicating to you and uh, getting the sermon out. Normally, we do this by audio, uh, but today we're going to try a little audio and video and uh, see how that works. So let me know. Give me a little bit of feedback whether you appreciated it this way or not. Uh, thanks to the guys, uh, the few that are here today, to try to get us uh, set up. Uh, before we get started, uh, let me just make a few announcements. I did send an email out this week uh, with updated address lists and email addresses for people in the congregation. Uh, we want to try to keep that updated, so let me know if, if there are any mistakes on that. Uh, but the real reason I sent that out was because during times like this, one of the best things we can do is to stay in contact with one another. And I don't know about you, but I've rediscovered the phone uh, over this past week. I think I've had more phone conversations uh, over the past week than I've had over the past uh, uh, three months. Uh, but it's been good, and uh, hopefully we can continue to stay in touch with one another uh, and use whatever means uh, we have available uh, to communicate. Uh, I know the Tuesday morning group is going to try to meet via Zoom this week at 7 o'clock, and you are welcome to join us on that. If you are interested, I can send you a link uh, that will show you how to do that. But anyways, uh, we trust uh, that God is being gracious to you during this time, and uh, we have been praying for you, the elders have been praying, and we have been praying, I trust, for one another. Uh, so we know that God will sustain us and even bless us in the time of uh, great uncertainty. So uh, before we begin, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to be, well, I'd like to begin, actually, uh, with the word of prayer. So let's, uh, let's come to the Lord together and uh, seek his face. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. And we come before you, God, recognizing your holiness and your majesty, your glory. You alone are worthy of all praise, and there is none like you. And we are dependent on you, Lord, for your help and strength, for wisdom and guidance, for health and healing, for forgiveness and restoration. May you grant your children these gifts, and may we know your grace in new and renewed ways. You've disrupted our normal lives. You are shaking the foundations of our world, and our prayer is that your purpose is not to bring condemnation, but rather to bring redemption. So bring the message of the gospel to this world that is lost. Uh, bring renewal to your church that we would cast off our idols and commit ourselves to walking closer to you. We would pray for those in our congregation who are physically vulnerable at this time. We would pray for their protection. We would pray for those in our congregation who are emotionally insecure, living in fear or anxiety. We would pray that you would bring them comfort and peace. And we would pray for those who doubt and have drifted far from you. We pray that your truth would overwhelm them so that they would be brought close. And Lord, during this time, we continue to ask for your grace to be extended to our government officials and to our hospital and medical workers, to our civil and military personnel. May all be given, all of whom are given the responsibility of looking after our needs. May you give them righteous wisdom and personal protection and courage. May they ultimately be your servants, accomplishing your purposes in this age. You alone are God. You alone can heal. You alone can hear and answer prayer. So hear us as we pray this day. Even as we look into your word, may your spirit speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to continue on our study that we've been on through the Gospel of John. And uh, today we are continuing, the, uh, uh, we're we're continuing to look at Pilate and Jesus' trial before him. And I'm going to pick up where we stopped last week, which was John chapter 18, verse 38. And I'm going to read a rather lengthy section up to John 19, verse 16. So hopefully you have your Bibles open. You can read along uh, with me. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. <laughs> 
Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his quarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So they delivered him over to them to be crucified. This is a, an interesting text to me because I have been asking this question all week. Jesus goes to the cross and dies for sin. I understand that. I understand that it was necessary in God's wisdom for a perfect sacrifice to be made for sin. Jesus, as the perfect man and, the, and God himself, is able to, per, to make that sacrifice by dying for sinners. But sometimes what I don't quite get is the suffering that is involved with Jesus' death and the suffering that is involved leading up to his death. In other words, why does, why does God send Jesus to the cross of all places? The cross is largely considered one of the cruelest ways to, to kill a person, to execute a person. It took a person sometimes days to die on the cross. It was slow, agonizing death. And even before Jesus' death on the cross, there is this there is this situation with Pilate where Jesus is suffering great in, in a number of ways. He's suffering injustice and he's suffering cruelty and he's suffering the mockery. Why does, why does God allow his son to experience such suffering in such way? And what I want to do this morning is look at two things. First of all, I want to look at the way Jesus suffered. And then I want to try to briefly answer that question, if, if at all I can even begin to understand the mind of God. Why would God allow his son to suffer in this way? But first of all, let's look at the way he suffered in our text. And he suffered in three basic ways. First of all, when Jesus is before Pilate, he's suffering injustice. Now, this injustice is pictured uh, rather poignantly in the beginning of the text that I read from the end of chapter 18 of the situation with this man by the name of Barabbas. Barabbas is a robber. Barabbas is an insurrectionist, we, we learn from the other gospel text. And Barabbas is a murderer. He's actually killed people. Jesus is none of those things. And yet, Pilate says, who would you rather me release? Jesus, your king, or would you rather me release Barabbas, the convicted robber, the convicted insurrectionist, the convicted murderer? And they cry out, release to us Barabbas. That's injustice. When you get tried and you are pronounced and you have to, to deal with the crime that somebody else committed, that's injustice. Jesus suffers great injustice. Jesus, the perfect man, the man who never even broke God's law, who did everything right, suffers injustice. And Barabbas, on the other hand, goes free. 
By the way, it's a perfect picture of what Jesus accomplishes for us on the cross. He takes on himself our sin and our guilt and atones for it, and we go free. But that's unjust, isn't it? And Jesus suffers injustice at the hand of Pilate and the crowd. But he also suffers violence. In verse 1 of our text, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Well, that's a nice short little sentence. He took him and he flogged him. Evidently, the Romans had three levels of flogging. There was a minor flogging, if you can call flogging a minor thing, uh, but there was a, one that you were flogged for a minor crime. You did something real simple. Maybe you, maybe you took a couple of pennies or you did something and you know, you're, a, you're a hoodlum or you're, you know, you're just a little kid or you're a young person, whatever it is. And they just want to teach you a lesson. So you, you get flogged and they send you on your way and tell you, don't ever do that again. There was another flogging sort of that they did for criminals. It was a little bit more severe. It hurts a little bit more. And it was a more significant depending on the crime that you committed. But there was a third level flogging. And this was the most serious for the most serious criminals. And usually it was reserved only for those criminals who died were, to, were condemned to die on the cross. It was for the worst of criminals. Now, the other Gospels tell us that Jesus received that extreme flogging before his crucifixion. But this flogging, it takes place before Pilate even condemns him, before he turns him over to be crucified. So what many Bible scholars say is that Jesus is receiving one of the lesser floggings first, and then he receives another flogging later, a flogging that is so severe, many people would die from it. A flogging where they would take a, a leather whip and attach stones and metal and bones of animals, cut bones and they would, they would flail the back until the, the flesh began to, to fall apart until in some cases you could see a person's internal organs. That's how bad the flogging was. And the other gospel writers tells us that Jesus received that flogging. John seems to be suggesting he received another flogging, which means Jesus was whipped not once, but twice. That's a lot of violence. That's a lot of pain. And to top it all off, Jesus is not only experiencing the physical pain, but he's being mocked. He's being ridiculed. The soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and, and they mock him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they strike him and say, who struck you? They're making fun of him. Jesus experienced physical suffering. You, you, you know, most of us, Nowadays, when people get to the point of death, you know what they do? They, they give you medications, they give you drugs so that, so that you slowly seep into death. And so, so death comes almost as natural as sleep and you don't feel any pain and you don't know what's going on. And, it, and Jesus experienced none of that. When, when God chose to bring his son into the world and to have him atone for sin through death, he attaches suffering to the whole process. And some of that is physical suffering. Some of that is violent suffering. Some of that is the emotional mocking and ridicule that took place. But there's a third way he suffers in this text. And that is he suffers rejection. There's a teeny little verse in the first part of John, John 1.11. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. And we... We glance over that verse rather quickly. He came into his own, but his own received him not. He was rejected by his own people. But here's a little principle. You ever been rejected by somebody? I guarantee you it did not feel good. I guarantee you, you didn't like it. And, and here's the principle. The, the closer a person is to you, the more painful the rejection is when they reject you. So a person that you've never met, you've, you've never seen him, you know, and, he's, and he somehow rejects you, you're like, who cares? I've never met him. I never had a conversation with him. Doesn't matter to me. He doesn't like me. I don't like him either. It doesn't matter. But the closer relationally that person is with you, the more painful the rejection is. So, so if your friends begin to reject you, that, that hurts a lot. If your family begins to reject you, that hurts you more. If your parents begin to reject you, that hurts you. If your spouse begins to reject you, that hurts you a lot. 
So Jesus comes into the world, and who's he rejected by? He's rejected by the people that are closest to him, by the people that worship the same God, by the people that he has, he has brought through the wilderness in the Old Testament, by the, by the people that he, has, that he has made a covenantal, loving relationship with. Those are the people who reject him. In our text, they cry out in 1840, in, in chapter 18, verse 40, the crowd cries out, don't release this man, release Barabbas. In 19, verse 6, they cry out, crucify him. In 19, verse 7, they say, he ought to die. In 19, verse 12, they say to Pilate, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. That's an, that's an insult, by the way. In 19, 15, they say, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And in 19, 15, they say, we have no king but Caesar. Which, by the way, when they said we have no king but Caesar, they not only rejected Jesus, but they were rejecting Yahweh. Because in the Old Testament, who's supposed to be their king? Yahweh is their king. So that when the Jews cry out, we have no king but Caesar, they're rejecting Yahweh. So, so deep is their hatred for Jesus that they're willing to reject Yahweh just to see Jesus crucified. That's how, that's how demonic their hatred is. That's how severe their rejection was. That's how severe Jesus was rejected by his own people. Jesus suffered in these ways. He suffered injustice. He suffered violence. And he suffered rejection. Now, the question is why? Why would God do this? In Isaiah 53, Verses 3 to 5, it says this, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. That's verse 3. But verses 4 and 5 tell us why he was rejected and in this way. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. Now that's the short answer why Jesus was rejected. Why he suffered so that we could have peace and healing. What is, the, what is the biggest problem people are struggling with right now, right today, in our nation and in our world? They need peace and they need healing. And that's why Jesus came to suffer. Let me give you three reasons why his suffering relates to us. First of all, in Jesus' suffering, he identifies with us. Hebrews 2, 17 to 18 says this, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He is able to help those who are suffering. He is able to help those who are going through hard times. There is nothing that you can face in this life that God has not already faced in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? Have you lost a child? God lost a child. Have you been physically bruised and beaten? Jesus was physically bruised and beaten. Have you been the victim of threats or false accusations or injustice? Jesus was the victim of injustice. Have you been anxious about the future? Jesus knew the future, and yet he prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He agonized about the future. You and I agonize about the unknown because we don't know what the future is. Jesus knew what the future was, which made the agony all the worse. Do you realize, do you realize that? He suffered, Hebrews tells us, in every way that you and I have suffered, so that, we are su so that when we are suffering, we have someone who knows what it's like. The remarkable thing about our God is the way he deals with suffering. 
There's no other religion where the God deals with suffering by entering into it. And that's what our God does. Our God doesn't remove suffering from us. He doesn't make it go away. Ultimately, he'll make it go away, but he doesn't make it go away as long as we're on this earth. As long as we're in this world, we will have trouble, he told the disciples. And so the way he deals with us having trouble is he shares in the trouble with us. I had a friend who called me this week who was in a lot of distress for a lot of good reasons. Uh, and his situation is frightening. It's scary on a number of different levels. And, and he, was, he was like all of us would be in that situation. He was distraught. And I could not tell him that it would be better that it, it would all get better, that he's over-exaggerating, that it's really not that big of a deal. Your odds are, are, are more happy. You know, you're, the odds are in your favor. I couldn't tell him any of that because I didn't know if it was true. It could be a really big deal what he's going through. But the only thing I could tell him was this, that the God of Jacob was with him. That there is a God who struggles with us when we go through times of great suffering and uncertainty and fear. In Isaiah 43, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I don't die? No. Why? Because death is fun? No. Because thou art with me. Psalm 16, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. You know how close your right hand is to you? It's as close as anything is. And the Lord is at my right hand. Over and over again, the scriptures remind us that God is with us in the midst of our suffering, and we know that because he himself suffered. The second reason he suffers is to serve as an example for us when we go through similar things. 1 Peter 2, verse 21, For, this, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. And in case you want to know what it's like to follow in his steps, you just read the next two verses. He, that is Jesus, committed no sin, neither was no deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus shows us how to suffer in his suffering. And how do we suffer? We suffer by not committing sin. We suffer by not returning evil for evil. We, we suffer by, by not threatening others, which Jesus did perfectly in this trial before Pilate. But Jesus also suffered by entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He surrendered himself to God. And that's how Jesus dealt with his suffering. Ultimately, he would say, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus suffered so he could show us how to suffer. And he suffered so he could enter into our suffering with us. But there's a third reason, and that is this. Jesus suffered so that he could redeem our suffering. In other words, suffering has value if you're a Christian. You realize that? It has extreme eternal value. What was the value to Jesus? The value to Jesus in his suffering was that many sons and daughters would be brought into the kingdom of heaven. The value of Jesus is that he, has, he, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, but that chastisement brought us peace and healing. There was value in Jesus' suffering. And the value was that it gave life to millions, for all we know, billions and billions of people. There was value because his suffering brought about the renewal of all the creation and will one day bring about the fulfillment of all of his kingdom. Now, here's the thing. If God can use the cross, the most horrific evil, the most horrific suffering anyone has ever undergone, if God can use the cross of his son to bring about ultimate good, he can use your little suffering to bring about eternal good too. I used to um, take, when I was younger, I used to take a lot of 
cross-country motorcycle, motorcycle trips. I'd get my buddies together and we'd go. Sometimes, we, you know, we, we'd go one trip, we went 6,000 miles. So we would go on long trips. And then years later, we would get together and we'd, we'd talk about the trips that we took. And when we talked about them, you know what we talked about? We didn't talk about the thousands of miles that we traveled where the sun was out and everything was great and the weather was nice, you know, and the birds were singing. We talked about the times where, you know, the bikes broke down or it rained like crazy and we got drenched or this problem happened or that problem. The, the thing that made the journey memorable was all the stuff that was difficult and hard. And I have a sense that that's what God's doing to us as well. When we go through times of difficulty and suffering and hardship, we, we are making memories for eternity. Heaven will be like this. We'll be sitting around talking about the times where life was really, really hard, but God was faithful. We'll be talking about the times where the, the, we couldn't meet to gather for worship on Sunday morning, but yet the church grew anyway. We'll talk about times where the economy was so unstable and no one had jobs and no one had money, but somehow God fed his people and showed himself to be faithful. These will be beautiful stories of God's faithfulness in the times of great suffering. I think heaven will be filled with those stories. And so the reason Christ suffers is so that he can show us and so that he himself in that suffering, when we enter into that suffering with us, our suffering now has eternal value and eternal purpose. Rick Warren used to famously say, God never wastes a hurt. Every bit of our pain can be used by God to accomplish his good purpose. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would take the struggles that we face even this day and use them for your glory. Thank you, Father, that you were willing to send your Son into this world to suffer so that we might live. May we entrust ourselves to this Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.